Hi, my name is Lars. I'm from Technica Engineering and I welcome you to my talk. It's titled, Your Automotive Protocol Stack, A Journey from Specification to SOP. I have been working on automotive Ethernet for more than 10 years and I want to give you some insights of the daily work we do with our customers and with our products. Enjoy. So my talk is structured as follows. We will look into protocol stack design. So what protocol are you using for which function? Then we go into requirements engineering, how to create a specification out of the ideas of your protocol stack. Then we look into testing and integration. And at the end, we want to talk a, li a little bit about logging and recording data in order to analyze that further. You want to design a protocol stack? Here are our simple rules to follow in order to get a good uh, protocol stack. Those are based on our experience of the last years. First of all, you try to reuse standards as much as possible because using a standard leads to better understanding. People may, might already know the standard and know where it's coming from. So that leads then in turn to better quality. The second rule is you want to limit the number of protocols to lower the complexity of the overall stack. For instance, you don't want to use two protocols doing exactly the same. Try to use one protocol and use it multiple times. And remember, your resources are limited. You don't have thousands of experts that can help you to write the specifications or find uh, errors later on. Try to limit that. Lower number of protocols leads to higher quality. And the third rule is learn from what other OEMs have, uh, have done in the past. So if you could, for instance, imagine that some protocols are already in serious production with other OEMs, chances are that they have tested those protocols before and their uh, protocols are already well tested, thus better quality. And for you, of course, a faster way to your SOP because a lot of work has been already done for others. Protocol stack recommendations. We basically have shown, uh, drawn a picture here with the example protocols or example protocol stack you could use as a starting point for your journey. Um, we based this on the regular ISO OC basic reference model with the seven layers. You've probably seen that before. On the bottom, on layer one, you can use different physical layer protocols. That means basically different files at the end, right, you're using. Um, the one thing you might uh, want to consider first is the 100 base TX protocol. That's the regular IT 100 megabit interface. Why would you need that? Oh, it's basically the way you're connecting the OBD. So on the OBD connector, that's what you have on there. So if you want to be able to uh, flash your, far, uh, your car like fast, the 100 megabit, you need the 100TX on that OBD connector. Inside the car, different speed crates are possible. The main uh, speed crates you often see are 100 megabit based, 100 base T1 uh, out of the same 802.3 standard like the 100 base TX and as well 1000 base T1 out of the same standard. Basically, those protocols are on a single twisted pair line and are automotive crate um, communication. Currently in standardization, or almost finished, is the multi-gig variant, giving you two and a half, five or 10 gigabit per second. And that's based on the 802.3 CH extension of the standard as well. On layer two, you want to use the regular Mac layer and you probably want also VLAN support, virtual LANs allow you to separate different traffic classes better on the Ethernet link. Both of that is standardized in the 802.1Q standard of the IEEE. And for that, there are some extensions you also want, like the QAV. That is the credit-based shaper that allows you to shape your audio and video streams in a way that you have the best experience for the customer at the end. Another feature here on the slide you can see on layer two is the timestamping which of course has been used for doing time synchronization protocols on top of that. And what you see here is the 802.1AS, generalized PTP. That is a very well understood protocol and used for automotive OEMs uh, in the world. And there's actually an automotive profile giving you like the best subset of that protocol to solve your problems. Another part you need for streaming audio and video through the car is the audio and video transport itself. That is based on 1722. AVB-TP, uh, AVB audio video transport protocol. And then if you look at layer three and four, 
Basically, those are like the typical software-based protocols we see in like every operating system, like a Linux or Windows and so on. What we see here is the TCP IP stack. And in our example, that's based on the IPv4 family. Well, the IPv4 family is a little older. It's, of course, a little bit more robust in the implementation quality, since there are many more years of experience in that implementation. Um, protocols of that family include, for instance, TCP, UDP, IPv4, ICMP, ARP, and DHCP, but there are a couple of others as well. But that's a good starting point because those are specified in really good to read IETF uh, RFCs. So those are the standards of the IETF. On top, on uh, layer 5 to 7, and we don't really you know, take those apart anymore because those are all the application layer in the internet world, we find three distinct protocols you want to consider. And that's, first of all, the diagnostics over IP, ISO 13400 protocol for transporting diagnostic and flash data. That's on the top left. If you look more to the right, you see the network management, or short NM. That is basically the protocol that allows you to say which function or which feature has to be available and which not, and what can go to sleep. That is specified in Odessa, and for Ethernet, it's called UDPNM. You might know CANNM for the CAN. UDPNM is basically the same thing on Ethernet. Between those two protocols, we find now a block which we have dedicated to or it's control communication. There are two main solutions in here. First of all, there's some IP, a solution that um, we will look a little bit more into details later on. And some IP is uh, the standard automotive way to transport services or service control communication. However, sometimes you might want to transport just a single CAN message or a FlexRAM message or a LIN message over your Ethernet as well. For that, we have a technology we are calling flexible digital network. And I will give you some insight on what you will learn creating that technology so that even if you don't want to use that technology, you can create something similar and get some insights of us. In addition to your protocol stack, there might be some other parts you want to consider. There's currently a new standard out for automotive ethernet. And instead of going for a higher bandwidth, this one went down to 10 megabits. It's called the 10 base T1S standard. And that standard has a 10 megabit ethernet in automotive that allows you to use a half duplex bus. So connecting multiple ECUs to a single bus instead of just a link and a switched ethernet. And on that bus, there's an arbitration scheme, which looks a little like a weighted round robin mechanism. So while that might not be the right solution for every use case, we're pretty um, interested in it because there are uh, certain use cases, especially on the lower end, for which you might close a gap on there before you have to go to a CAN or CAN FD on the very low end. The second thing you probably want to look into is the um, time-sensitive networking. There are multiple layer two enhancements that are starting to show up in Ethernet semiconductors, especially in switches. So we have put some of those here on the slide and we will go over them very quickly, give you some idea what they would mean and what they are. And we think that there might be some additional things you might want to use in the future. The first of them is the 802.1 CB. It's frame replication and elimination for reliability. And what does that do? Exactly what the title would suspect. Basically, it allows you to run the frames over multiple links redundantly and that gives you a way in having like an ethernet level redundancy. You might not need that in many use cases because you have a system level redundancy and maybe have an ethernet and a flexor on the other side or two different ethernet links with different messages for the redundancy. However, if you need to have ethernet level redundancy, the 802.1cb can be of help. The next interesting TSN feature is the 802.1qbu that's frame preemption. Why do you want to use frame preemption? And that is the case if you have a very high priority message and you have to wait before you can send it out on a link because of another packet being in front of you and it already started sending. So that's what we call head of line blocking. The frame preemption now allows you to stop the currently being sent frame at certain spots in the middle of the product, uh, packet and you can basically overtake a packet which was already been sent. 
The next one on the list, 802.1 QBV, Enhancements for Scheduled Traffic. That allows you to give you some this, uh, a certain traffic class, a certain time slot when they are about to be sent. That gives you, of course, control over multiple switches if they are time synchronized, that you can do some certain latency calculations here and can better shape what the maximum latency of certain messages should be. The edit to that 1QCH, cyclic queuing and forwarding, does something similar but has certain features to have some aggregation here, putting multiple um, frames in certain time uh, areas. So that might be something you want to look into as well. And last but not least of the T, um, TSN features we are presenting here is the edit to that 1QCI. And that's called per stream filtering and policing. And that basically gives you like a um, way in how the policer should work. I mean, many switches have those today uh, already, but it also gives you like a feeling in how many you need. So what we expect is that with 802.1 QCI, the switch windows will have more policing built in. And that basically gives you the possibility that on an ingress port, you can limit unwanted traffic or can limit the wanted traffic to a certain bandwidth, packet sizes, etc. Keep in mind that all those TSN features, of course, currently not decided what makes most sense for you. That probably depends a lot on your use cases and there's a lot of industry-wide discussion going on. Even we don't know exactly which of those features will survive the next couple of years. Will it be all? Will it be none? Something in between probably. We will see. And we have even more additions to your protocol stack you have to consider. One thing we have hardly discussed so far is security. Well, we have shown you the VLANs, the virtual LAN feature of the Mac layer, or at least said that as something you want to have. There's more security features you want to put in your protocol stack or they're relating to your protocol stack. The most important thing here at the top is the network security. So you want to be able to protect messages against manipulation or maybe even against eavesdropping so nobody can see what's in the message. Our preferred solution here is the IEEE MACSAC. 82.1 AE is the standard for that. And the reason for our recommendation is, is simple. This protocol can protect all the unicast, multicast and broadcast messages at line speed. So it makes it very easy to have a very strong security foundation for your network. Additionally, you might want to consider SSL TLS, IPsec and VPN protocols for the connectivity towards your backend. So you want to protect the channel between your car and your infrastructure, your IT servers. And then, of course, for the lower speed bus systems, or maybe sometimes for Ethernet messages as well, the secure onboard communication standard, SecOC, also gives you a way to protect messages against manipulation. That is more in an application layer, so on Ethernet that would not really cover much, only selected use cases, but especially on Canon Flex, where that might work quite well. The second security feature you have to somehow see related to your stack or put in your stack is access control. You might want to keep in mind that for a device connecting to your Ethernet switch, that you might want to have some access control here based on 82.1x. That goes hand in hand with the MacSec, by the way, and that helps you to only let devices in on certain ports that really should be there. On some IP, you might want to have some uh, policy enforcement as well. So what could happen there is you say, like basically the following applications of my ACU can only connect to the following services, or the other way around, you're looking at what ECUs are connecting to a certain some IP service on your ECU and then have some policy that says like you're allowed to do that or not. Very common feature is packet filtering or firewalling. You probably have heard of that. Typically you see that for layer three and four, um, but you can also do this on layer two if you have the right silicon. And of course, feature sets and those switches, for instance, that's a very powerful uh, feature you want to really consider here as well. And at the end, something you don't really see in your protocol stack is intrusion detection. We just put it here in order to point that feature out and you want to have a scalable distributed solution on, uh, for that. And you probably want to transport the intrusion detection data inside your network, protect them with some network security and maybe run them over some IP, for example. Like promised, here's a slide about some IP. Some IP is the most used middleware in automotive. And I'm really proud because I created almost all of the specifications and um, have a good insight in the, that technology, therefore. 
So why are OEMs using some IP as their primary middleware to uh, communicate data? Basically, some IP creates the abstraction you really need in automotive. That means it was created for automotive. It scales from very small to very high performance, big computer kind of ECUs. And of course, um, it supports all the use cases you have in automotive. One thing that's really important here is that we have built in a service discovery that gives you some flexibility. It auto configures things for you. It allows you to um, find your services, configure your stack. But at the same time, it does not give you too much flexibility. As an OEM, you can basically control how much flexibility you want to give your system. And in that way, you have this controlled flexibility that really allows you to create a good automotive solution. What's also really important about some IP and is one of the outstanding features, it is supported by Autosa as classic Autosa as well as adaptive Autosa. And that's one of the only solutions that can do that. So you basically can not only put it on a certain ECU in your car, you can put it on all of the ECUs that follow Autosa and also smaller devices and uh, even bigger devices. Um, some IP is license free, so you don't have to uh, be afraid of patents or have to pay a license for that. And uh, what's for me really important, some IP is really fast in the serialization. We have designed the serialization to be really fast. I will show you on the next slide how that really works and um, how that we made that efficient. And of course, some IP is not only the serialization and the service discovery, there's some more building blocks in there like subscription mechanisms to uh, allow you to uh, allow an ECU to say which EC, uh, which messages it needs to get, and then of course there are some features like the some IPTP, which is more like a segmentation based feature for very large messages. And like I said, some IP was designed for the automotive use case. Here we have an uh, insight for you about the some IP serialization. If you look at communication, the faster your link speed gets, the more messages you have to process. So it's really important that your serialization is fast enough to, enough to keep up with that. On embedded systems, of course, your resources are very limited, so you need to have a very efficient and fast solution as well. So what we have done here on the right side of the slide, we try to map out a couple of well-known solutions here. We have the top part, which are binary-based solutions, so the messages are binary, the way you serialize your data into is binary, and then there are text-based protocols on the bottom. And from the left to the right, we're moving from self-descriptive to not so self-descriptive uh, solutions, also giving you some insights here. Let's start with the text-based protocols. You probably have seen um, protocols built which transform an XML or a JSON-based file, right? They're both text-based and structured files. So very good for like, you know, uh, looking at them uh, and, you know, understanding what is in there without even knowing a specification for them. What's important here is those are really good solutions for prototyping. However, they're very slow, right? String parsing is not something that you can do like arbitrary fast. It's kind of a lot of work to do here. On the binary formats, that's better, right? You can get better performance out of them. And we have uh, shown here a couple of typical used IT protocols. And there are many of them, for instance, like the TLV kind of protocols. For instance, Apache Edge as a solution that uses a TLV approach. Protobuf also uses a TLV-like approach. Those protocols are typically very flexible, but that makes them a little slow. Protobuf, Flexbuf, and TLV formats all overall are a little slow, but they're still better than text-based protocols. Um, and the way they are slow is because of their self-descriptiveness. On the right to the slide, I marked a spot where we want to be, actually. We want to have a non-descriptive binary protocol, and we want to get as fast as possible. That means as fast as, for instance, an internal um, raw struct would be, right? A raw struct, of course, is not a serialization, but as as fast as it can get if you pass data inside an ECU, and we want to get close to that. And on the design of some IP, and for instance, also a flat buff, as in similar design, you're getting fast if you have a fast way to copy or not copy the data too much, right? Basically, what you're looking for is a zero copy approach because every copy, every I.O. where you do something on a data costs you time and you want to optimize as fast as possible. So what do we learn? Text-based protocol, pretty slow, don't want that. And if you use binary, go for the faster solutions and some IP is right up there in a the very fast corner and that's where you want to be. So 
with some IP, obviously you can build like very fast and very high efficient solutions. So that supports like high speeds as well as small devices with not so high speeds, but of course faster than with other solutions. Here we have another insight of some IP. This time we will look at some IP service discovery timings. I have been asked in the past multiple times by customers, how do we create good timings on the some IP service discovery? There are so many configuration options and what do they really mean? Here I want to give you a small insight into that and basically what you can see is some IP or the some IP service discovery to be more specific follows a three phase approach. We have the first phase we call the initial wait phase that we get the system ready. We might be able to aggregate multiple uh, services together so that before we send out information about them, we can build bigger messages. Then we have the repetition phase. That one we want to use for fast synchronization. We start up fast and try to find everything we need in the network and offer our services to everyone in the network. After that, we'll go to the main phase. The main phase is for stabilization. We're sending in a slower um, uh, frequency and just want to make sure that the system stays alive and is stabilized. What's important here, the choices of the timings is of course, they are very critical because your startup performance depends on your timings and the performance in an error situation depend on that. And you really want to do a good analysis here. And of course, having some experience, uh, for instance, prototypes helps a lot. Uh, however, we want to give you a starting point and we put that on the bottom and in the plot on the left side. Um, basically, those are based on standards. I got them out of some um, example implementations, some presentations of people, um, because I know those timings are pretty good. I've seen them before, and those are the ones you want to start with uh, You're doing your tuning. Yes, that's not everything you need, but it's a very good starting point. So try that. Set the repetition base delay to 30 milliseconds. Do the repetition, uh, repetitions max to three main cycle to one second and the TTL to three seconds and it will look similar to what you see on a sequence diagram on the left side. You have four messages before you go into the main phase, have very fast startup even in error situations, and then have a very stabilized system after that. Okay, as promised, this time we will discuss now a simpler form of communication which you might want to have in parallel to some IP. You might want to transport CAN or LIN or Flexware messages over Ethernet. How do you transport such legacy messages and how do gateway depends a little bit on your overall architecture and design. We can give you out of our solution, which we call flexible digital network, a couple of interesting input. So you have some insights in order to create your own solution. First of all, our rule is and was avoid the complex gateway strategies that are possible. Try to make the gateway as simple as, it can, as you can in order to get the performance up and keep the la uh, latency down. The more operations you do on a message, of course, the longer it takes, right? So you want to save that time. For the format on the wire, try to stick with standard formats like the socket adapter based uh, format in Autosar, right? You have a big ID and you have a length field. That's good enough. And there are some cool things you can do with that. And then the last thing is to give you some, some uh, starting point as well is we have a prototype which we build, which we have a CAN or a CAN FD convert that to ethernet, convert it back and overall you can get significantly below two milliseconds with that. So just give you an idea on how good you can be if you just transport CAN over ethernet and then trans put it back to CAN. Here you have a sh very short slide about requirements engineering. Typical issues you have if we see specifications is that specifications are very hard to understand. You might not want to define the goal of the specification, explain everything, you just want to specify what to do. But if I'm looking at the specification and don't understand what you're writing there, it's very hard for me to build the right system, to integrate the right system, or to create something that is without bugs. So that's a major problem with many specifications. The second thing we see pretty often is that OEMs tend to have a lot of specifications and they get longer and longer. It's not unheard of that a tier one typically has thousands of pages of specification that are relevant for the job they're doing. How do you know all the requirements of thousands of pages of specifications? 
I don't know. And that's basically one of the problems. The more you have of those uh, requirements that are relevant, the harder it gets to follow all of them. Maybe you can reference a standard in order to uh, you know, get rid of most of those requirements if there's a standard out there. And of course, if you use a standard, like for instance, Autosar based specifications, then make sure that Autosar specification can be configured in their behavior. And you probably want to make sure that you also explain a little what your configuration is aiming for behavior wise. So what do you want to do? Include some explanations on the specification. That could be maybe like a small introduction at the beginning of a chapter or might be at some points like additional like information that is in the uh, Excel table or doors export. Second, reference as much as possible like standards and stick to those standards as well. For instance, just say, you know, I want to use some IP, I want to use DPNM. It's much easier than explaining your own protocols and describing them there. And the third and last thing we recommend is create a presentation or a training about your specification, your configuration and your system design in order to make tier ones, tier twos or others better understand what you're building or you want to build. That makes a better understanding and the better understanding creates better quality at the end. Stack testing. Many OEMs are not testing their stacks good enough. And with Ethernet being new and complicated, it's understandable. There are so many standards, so many requirements and so many unseen bugs that of course it's very hard to have a good strategy for testing. And of course, you need very good experts for doing the tests. And we all know nobody has enough experts in these times. So a common mistake is in that situation and to just say, you know, the tier one does all the stack testing and you leave the tier one alone with that. Because if the tier one doesn't understand your requirements or what you want to create, how can he find the issues of what he implemented? Well, it's very hard. He probably cannot do that. So we recommend use a third party with third party tools in order to get better testing and have like a second set of eyes looking at the product. And then of course, there's another common problem. If you leave the tier one, the testing, um, be assured that all the OEM specific requirements cannot be tested easily by a standard tool. So you need a specific tool for your specific requirements. And that might be quite difficult to get and might be quite difficult to create. Integration. Many aspects of the communication stack are by nature distributed. So if we are not only looking at a single stack, but a combination of different stacks or different ECUs, you will find things you cannot find in a single ECU testing. So what do you do now? You often put together all your ECUs into the car or your test car, and then you find the problem. But isn't that a little too late? Don't you want to do this a little earlier? So what we recommend here is um, an approach of front loading that ethernet integration. The integration of the ethernet network has to be done as early as you can. So why do you wait for putting the ECUs in the car? Just put them on a table, put them together, do your tests. You want to record the data while doing that. You want to test the integration. You want to analyze that data, the recording, and as well as the test results. And you will find problems. You will do some startups. You will see some issues when starting up or shutting down. And if you find them in that phase, that's already better than finding them when you put it in the first cars. What is the benefit? Easy. Your Ethernet cluster is stable faster, and that means the overall quality is much better. Common problems in logging. As you can imagine, recording Ethernet data or Ethernet logging is more difficult than doing that same thing for CAN. Of course, CAN is slower, but that's not the only difference. Important is that on a switched Ethernet network, data is only present on the links it really needs to travel on. So you need to record all the links in order to see all the packets. And that amount of data can be quite high. So you have to take care here. A really important thing is that if you run protocols like A2.1AS or any flavor of PTP actually, then of course you have timing sensitive protocols and you must make sure that the logging setup 
or the way you record the data does not interfere with that in a way that basically renders the overall system useless. And of course, it's not only Ethernet that has problems with logging. Um, we often see as customers that if you run a record CANFD, that's not that easy either, because here again, you have to think about the topology. So you cannot just place your logger somewhere in the car and then run all the CANFD lines there because they might get too long. So here you need solutions for those Ethernet and even for the CANFD problems. And what you want to do is you want to look for equipment designed for Ethernet and you want to be able to split the data acquisition probes of the logger. So you record the data at one spot on the car and transport it to a logger which, uh, which is somewhere else. DLT, XCP and other protocols on the vehicle. So there are certain protocols out there like the Diagnostic Lock and Trace Protocol, DLT, or the Unified Measuring and Calibration Protocol, XCP, that are used in uh, development for getting data out of the ECU, like internal data, log data, which you want to have on a logger in order to find bugs faster. Unfortunately, if you want to use Ethernet for transporting the data, you basically regular in-vehicle network, then you're interfering with that because now the logger has to be somewhat in that network. So especially the timing protocols like one as they react quite sensitive if your logging setup introduces jitter into the link because you are currently injecting some data, some control messages for those protocols. So you want to make sure that as is a use case you have thought about and designed that into your setup and all your equipment can work with that use case. Links and timestamps matter. So what's the problem? We often get traces by customer to find problems in the traces. And what we can often say is that the data was not recorded in a way that you can find all the problems. So if you look at uh, Ethernet, you have different links and you have different um, directions on each link. And then of course you have CAN. Let's imagine you have a message traversing one link to another going over a switch and you want to know and how long did it stay in the switch. Maybe does the switch have too many messages in between? Or you're having a CAN message that's being routed to Ethernet and you want to see if the gateway is working the right way. In order to do that, you need to record the link on which the packet was, as well as the direction. And of course, and that's not only for Ethernet, but for every technology, a very good timestamp. What makes a timestamp very good? You have a good resolution, so a nanosecond resolution, for instance, and it's synchronized over all your data acquisition equipment. All the modules capturing the data in the network have the same timestamp. Link failures. Here's a problem right out of our daily life. We had a customer ask us about our opinion. What did the customer see? He had the problem that he had certain failures, like lost messages, something went wrong and he couldn't really determine where it's coming from. And the analysis turned out that the links were not stable, his Ethernet links. And that's not because the ECUs were bad, but the logging equipment put in there was bad, or the cables were bad, or the connectors were bad. So what happens here is that from time to time, that link went down and up again really quick, but that short timing between it made a really big impact on what happened. What was really hard uh, was to find the problem because the logging solution did not record all the metadata you would have liked for that. So if you can do uh, record the link quality of Ethernet links and do record the link up and link down events of all ports. If you have that data for of your, all your test car fleet, do automated analysis on that data and it helps you to better co quality control your test car fleet. And of course, in addition, that could be also indicators that the ECU on the other side of your test equipment has a problem as well. Logging, state of the art. Until here, everything was a little bit more theory. Now we want to show you an example setup so that you can have some understanding on what we are talking about. What you can see here are our capture modules. Those are the modules we created to uh, do the data acquisition. What you can see are eight different, or some of them are the same actually, capture modules that can record, for instance, in this example, 3000 base T1 lines, 12 100 base T1 lines, 12 CANs or CANFDs, two flex rays, 20 LINs, four RS232s, and a couple of other analog lines, for instance. That's like a sample setup for a customer. 
At the top you see our new product which can basically aggregate all the data together and send over a single 10 gigabit link the data to a logging device. I mean a PC is probably not fast enough these days but a typical automotive logger with a 10 gigabit interface can be used here. In addition our equipment can also time synchronize all the capture modules we're using here and all our capture modules are sending the data out via TCMP. So that's an example of how all the things I discussed before um, are implemented and can be used for instance as example with our equipment. Logging state of the art part two. I have said a lot of the times before TCMP. What is TCMP? TCMP is a technically enhanced capture module protocol. It's a free and open state-of-the-art protocol and it supports transporting data, so the data you logged or recorded, and of course the metadata attached to it, like the link quality, or what was the link going up and down, and which link is it, what was the direction, or is it a CAN, which CAN is it, all those kind of metadata. And then of course it transports that towards the logger. TCMP supports Ethernet, CAN, CANFD, Flexway, and many other technologies, so you probably have all your uh, technologies covered. The good thing is TCMP is not only free and open, you can also get an open source implementation with the new Wireshark released uh, end of October, the version 3.4. It's already integrated. As soon as you open a trace file with the TCMP in it, you can already see everything. So you're ready to go. This brings me to our summary of today's talk. Protocol stack design, reuse your standards, and be focused. Don't use too many protocols. Then we looked at requirements engineering. Make sure that the tier one or tier two can understand what you want him to understand and that he or she can build the best product. Testing and integration. Think about third-party testing, third-party integration. And if you do integration, do it early. Logging and recording was our fourth chapter we looked into. Go for state-of-the-art solutions that cover all the key features you need, like metadata, like synchronized timestamps, and flexibility so you can record all different technologies. Overall, the recommendations were geared towards raising the quality of your overall product, making your SOP better. I want to thank you for listening to my presentation. While I would have preferred to do this presentation face to face, we hope that you find this material interesting and as well insightful. What's important to us is that we want to stay connected to you. You can find my contact information right on that slide, but as you can see, we work together in Japan with our local partners, and one of them is responsible for product distribution and the other is doing engineering projects together with us. Please contact them and visit their online booths for further information. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. And most important, stay safe.